And, and you can't say, well, God just gave him his divine nature uh, at, at birth. No. Jesus was, was always God from the moment of conception. All right, so you're, you're going to need that paper eventually. Not it, we, It's just for later reference. All right. Um, okay. So you don't create two persons. As Colossians 1.16 says, For in Him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Now, every time I quote Scripture, I'm going to help you to remember, because I'm going to keep saying it, so that when you talk to somebody who's Protestant, remind them. Inerrant. Infallible Scripture. Alright? Bible. So, if it says it in Scripture, we have to believe it. Alright? Malachi 3 6 and James 1 7. Divine nature can't change. So Christ's divine nature didn't change at his birth. Okay. Alright. Where is that? I'm sorry. Oh, uh, about the middle of the page. Okay. okay. Uh, 32. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Alright, we're on Mary and the Saints. Okay. So, Mary the new Eve. Now, um, St. Paul calls uh, Jesus the new Adam. All right? Just as Adam brought sin into the world, Jesus brings the healing and forgiveness into the world and undoes the sin of Adam. Okay? So, if Jesus is the new Adam, the early father's right, then who is the new Eve? It's Mary. Well, how does that work? Obviously, Eve was his wife. Mary is not his wife. It's Jesus' mother. Well, in the old days, before Jesus, kingdoms had a king, and they had a queen. But the queen was not the king's wife. The king had hundreds of wives. And look at Solomon. And hundreds of concubi concubines. <coughs> Can you imagine the headaches with the mother-in-laws with this? <laughs> so, he couldn't have one wife who was queen. So, who was queen? The mother, his mother. The queen mother, just like we have in England, the queen mother is who held the throne next to the king. So you read about Solomon, and he puts a, he puts a, a throne next to his, actually on his right-hand side, and it's for his mother, Bathsheba. So when she enters, he actually bows to her. And when somebody in the kingdom had a problem, they didn't go to the king. <coughs> they went to the king's mother, and she petition the king for them. All right, That's all in Scripture. That's Old Testament. But that's what we have. And so, if you look at the title of the new Eve, the new Adam and the new Eve, you can learn a lot and you kind of it kind of gives a better understanding of all these other titles of Mary. Alright, so let's go through a couple of those together. Well, let's go, before we do that, Justin Martyr writing in 155, he says, Eve, a virgin and undefiled, conceived the word of the serpent and bore disobedience and death. But the Virgin Mary received faith and joy when the angel Gabriel announced to her the glad tidings that the Spirit of the Lord would come upon her and the power of the Most High would overshadow her. So very early on in the second century, they're talking about Mary as the new Eve. All right, Tertullian writes, Why is Christ called Adam by the apostle? And at the bottom of that he says, as Eve had believed the serpent, so Mary believed the angel. And Augustine, whom Protestants revere, through a woman we were sent to ruin, through a woman salvation was restored to us. Talking about Mary. So, here about midway down the page, in understanding Mary as the new Eve, many of the titles, other titles and teachings about Mary become clear. Because she is the new Eve, like Adam, she was born immaculate, just as the first Adam and Eve were created immaculate. As the new Eve, she is the mother of new man humanity, Christians, just as the first Eve was the ma mother of all humanity. And as the new Eve, she shares the fate of the new Adam. Whereas the first Adam and Eve died and went to dust, the new Adam and Eve were lifted up bodily into heaven, the assumption. The church fathers speak of Mary's immaculate nature in anticipation of her son's redemptive death on the cross. And Mary was the first to say yes to Jesus, making her the model disciple. 
And so, what is this quote from? What is that? Where are we? The yeah, eleven. You just read. Yeah, where is it? Oh, go to go to the very back of the book. Oh, and it's and number eleven. I'll give it to you. And that's all these notations. That's Scott where you Hahn. find them. Number eleven is from Scott Hahn. And the, the video clip is the Bible and the sacrifice and the mass. Okay. So all these little notations you can find in the back. Uh, okay. Go, down, go to the next page, 34. One of the objections we have uh, quite often is that Jesus calls Mary woman. He does it twice. He, when Mary comes to him, he says, Woman, what has this to do with me? And another time, which should tell you more, is at the cross. Because he looks down and he sees John and his mother and he mm -hmm. says, Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. And he's giving her to John. All right. So, instead of disrespecting her, it's just the opposite. He's giving her a title of respect. Woman, to say woman, number one, recalls Eve, who was called woman. All right. Number two, it's more of a, a term like madam or or ma'am. All right. So it's not a sign of disrespect. It's a sign of dignity. People do read it that way, or like thinking of how we we speak do it in today. English, you know, okay. they're like using their intellect for today. Right. And and uh, we're going to do this over and over today. <laughs> you can't think in 21st century English, American English. You have to think in first century. Jewish culture and, and dialogue, a dialect. All right. So this is the English translation, but you're exactly right to say woman. We would say woman. No, he's saying he's saying woman. He's giving her a title of respect. How do we know that? Well, Jesus is God, right? All Christians believe this, and this is how I want you to talk to the Protestants to help them understand. We're not here to beat them about the head and chest with this. Alright? But if you can help them understand, this is the church with 2,000 years of study, history, and perseverance, and, and teaching, and we should be able to help the Protestants understand that as well. So if Jesus is God, can God disobey one of His own commandments? No. What is the commandment? I mean, Honor your father, 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 father. Jesus would not have obeyed, disobeyed his own commandment. All right. So we know he wasn't being disrespectful for, to Mary. How else do we know? Look down here, uh, about uh, three quarters down that section. In John 2 4, when Jesus asked Mary, What have you to do with me? He's not rebuking her. In the same way, the. the the exact same phrase in Luke 8, 28, when, they, when the demons asked Jesus, what have you to do with us? The demons aren't rebuking Jesus. God wouldn't allow a demon to rebuke the Son of God. What they're saying is, you have power. What are you going to do with us? When he says, woman, what does this have to do with me? He's saying, you have power. What is it you want me to do? you got to think in the first century Jewish mindset. It's not 21st century American English. Okay? All right. Great, great suggestion. All right. Mary, the mother of all Christians. Just want you to understand that when Jesus looks down and he gives Mary to John, the only way that happens... And, and it, it says right after that that from that moment on, Mary lived with John. He took her into his home. And she lived with him until she died. Alright? We'll get into that in a minute. She didn't live with Joseph? Joseph was dead. Oh, okay. Never yeah, Joseph it was gone by that time. Okay. Alright? That's also... While you're saying that, let me just get to there. There is a, there is a uh, Gospel of James. It's not in Scripture. It's called the Proto-Evangelium of James. And in this, that's how we know who Mary's parents were. All right, that's, That gives us their names. But it also says that Joseph was an elderly widow, widower and that he had adult children. All right? And so, 
because Mary, it also says that Mary's mother had dedicated her to the temple, just as Samuel had been by his mother. And so you hear of, of the temple virgins, well, she would have been a temple virgin and dedicated her life as a virgin to service in the temple. All right? Well, if all of a sudden she comes up, uh, or she has to be married as a young girl, well, they would have had to find someone that would marry her that would respect that vow of, of virginity. If Joseph is an older widower, that would make sense. He would respect that. All right? And so, is that gospel? No. But it is from my early writing, and that's where we get that information. All right. So, that's kind of an aside. Um, actually, if you read the Proto-Evangelium of James, it's a beautifully written uh, book. It's, it's fine stuff. Anyway, all right. So, the only way that Mary can go to live with John is if he has no brothers at all. All right. Now, I know we're going to get to Mary ever virgin and we'll get to about him having brothers but he can't have had brothers because she would have by Jewish culture she would have lived with them the only way she lives with John is if he has no brothers okay it would have been a scandal in Jewish society okay all right um, also in verse 17 of Re uh, uh, Revelation 12 it says the offspring of Mary are those who keep God's commandments. In other words, all Christians. She is the mother of all Christians. Okay, page 35. Mary the Assumption. Now, this is the way the Catechism states it. At the end of our earthly life, God assumed Mary body and soul into heaven and granted by God to Mary because her body was the perfect ark that bore the second person of God, Jesus it makes sense that God would want to preserve her body from corruption. I forgot about this this morning. I'm going to have to remember next week to go back into it. There is a, within just the last few years, there is a scientific discovery, and it's called microchimerism. All right? Microchimerism. The C -A chimerism with the CH? Yes. All right. And look it up. And what it said, scientists have discovered that no matter if you, if a woman is pregnant, doesn't matter how long the pregnancy is, doesn't matter if she carried the baby to term or not, that the baby in the mother's womb leaves behind a small number of cells, DNA, in her womb forever. She carries it forever. All right? Think about this, the implications for the assumption. If Mary carries Jesus in her womb and even after he is risen and she still has Jesus in her womb to the to the day she dies would God let her decay into the earth if some of Jesus is still in her no, no. that's a scientific discovery and it's a recent scientific discovery mm -hmm. and science is continually proving the teachings of the church right Okay, beyond that, I had forgotten all about that. Somebody, I don't have it in front of me, somebody remind me of that. I'm going to remember for next week to tell the morning group. I've heard it theorized that that's part of why mothers suffer so much when their children die. Oh. Is there oh. still a part of them? Oh. Oh, absolutely, that absolutely. Even if, uh, what is it, Isaiah 22, is it? Even if your mother, uh, the mother forgets you, I will not forget you. Okay, um, now, the assumption of Mary says that at the end of her life, we assume, and there is another writing that says that she died, that the apostles placed her in a tomb, and when they came back, she was gone. Now, how do we know that uh, they didn't just bury her somewhere, and this is the deal. If you had a the remains, the whatever, a relics of a pope, a, a bishop, one of the early leaders of the church, evangelist. As a city, you display that and put the word out. You're going to advertise it because it brings people into your city to, to come. 
All right. No one has ever claimed to have the remains of Mary. Anywhere at any time. Because, in fact, there was an emperor who, who brought in one of the, the early leaders and said, I want Mary's body here. And he said, you can't. There, there is no body. God assumed her into heaven. All right. Now, there are, in the Old Testament, there are two places. Enoch was taken, as Genesis 5, 24, uh, into heaven without dying. And in 2 Kings, Elijah was assumed in a fiery chariot right in front of Elisha's eyes. He, he was taken up into heaven. All right. So we have two assumptions in the Old Testament. Why wouldn't he do that for his mother? He would. All right. And this is the deal. If um, and Jesus is God, and it says in Scripture that all things were created in First John, uh, first chapter of John, that all things were created through Jesus. So Jesus being God, and all things are created through Him. That means Jesus created Mary, created his own mother. All right. Would you let her stay in, and decay into the earth? No. All right. So using reason and scripture, I want to get to that. Now, let me, let me read you this. This is by a former nun, no longer Catholic, and she uses the catechism and scripture to back up what she says. And she says, in the Gospel of John... Uh, the, it says the Gospel of John was written around 90 A.D. Book of the Apocalypse, about 100. If Mary had been supernaturally assumed into heaven, would it John, the disciple who Mary lived with, have mentioned it? Bad argument, bad logic. That is assuming that everything that happened that was important is in Scripture, and it's not. So, if, if, if you know a little bit about uh, the history of the Jewish people, there was a temple that Solomon built. That's the Old Old Testament. All right, the, the temple of Solomon, and eventually the, the the invaders come in, the Syrians, Babylonians. I can't remember who, but they destroy it. Okay. Well, when finally when they are the Jews are allowed to come back to Jerusalem, they rebuild the temple. And it's destroyed again in 70 A.D. The Romans destroy it because the Jews have rebelled and they lock themselves inside of the city gates. And the Jews destroy the temple. The temple was the most important thing for a Jew. It, it was the center of his life. If anything's going to be in Scripture, it should have been that. But guess what? And that's during John's lifetime. John didn't die till around 100. And yet, it's nowhere in Scripture. So it's just bad logic, bad argument, okay? It's just not, that's, not everything is in Scripture. Okay, get back to this. Revelation 11 through 12. The ark in, in heaven is the woman clothed with the sun, which describes Mary. It says that the woman bore a male child who is to rule the nations, who was caught up to God and to his throne. The male child can only be Jesus. So the woman, clothed in the sun, with a crown of 12 stars on her head, can only be Mary. All right. What did the 12 what stars represent? What does it say about that? I mean, what is there, how can you get around that? They will dance all around it. Yeah, just like a lot of other things. But, all right, what do the 12 stars represent? The, tw uh, the 12, 12 tribes. 12 tribes and the 12 apostles. Oh, okay. Twelve tribes being the old Israel, yeah. oh, okay. and the twelve apostles, apostles being the, the twelve judges that sit and judge the nations. So she's in charge of them. All right. Mm. And because it's a crown, and it describes it in Revelation as a crown of twelve stars. Guess what? She's a queen. Yeah. All right. Now, now I, I excuse me, but I had heard also somewhere that she was the. Ark of the Covenant. Yes, we're going to get to that. Okay, too. very good. Get very good. You're right. All right, Melito in 300 writes, As you, Jesus, reign in glory, so you should raise up the body of your mother and take her with you, rejoicing in heaven. So you see early on, and they, before that, you have Gregory the Wonder Worker and Athanasius. So in the third century and on, they're teaching about Mary's assumption. Why wasn't it written before that? 
Well, actually, you do. Actually, there are some writings before that. Uh, I had forgotten about that. But mostly because it was common knowledge. You, you don't have to write it down if everybody they knows it. it. All right? Yeah. That's true of a lot of things, not just the teachings about Mary. All right, so in the commentary, we have other assumptions. We talked about Enoch and Elijah. And obvious, uh, well, we we'll get past that one. Uh, we're going to go down to the bottom of the page. We'll go to what Rodney's talking about. Bottom of 35. It's called biblical typology. Now, that means that, and we'll talk about Jesus. Jesus was a type of Adam. He was a type of Moses. Jesus was a type of Solomon. A type of David, King David. Each of these, and you look at Jesus being the fulfillment of those types of characters, okay? And so the early fathers write about typology. And so Mary was a type of Eve, okay? Give you an example. But Mary, they wrote about as the Ark of the Covenant, all right? The original Ark was made with, with gold, incorruptible metal, but then so was the Ark uh, of the New Covenant, Mary. The Ark of the Original Covenant, the, the, ark, the original Ark of the Covenant contained the Ten Commandments, the Word of God in stone. But Mary had the Ark of the New Covenant held her, in her womb the very Word of God made flesh. Contained in the original Ark was the Rod of Aaron, which symbolized the priesthood. All right? But in Mary's womb was God's High Priest, Jesus. In the original Ark, they put some of the manna that God sent down from heaven for the, for the Israelites in the desert. The bread that God sent down. But in Mary, the new ark was the true bread of life come down from heaven that gives eternal life. Alright, so it's clear that Luke is writing with this typology in mind because he uses very specific words and he's a Jew listening to this would have go, oh, he's talking about Mary as the ark. Okay? So, I want you to look in the middle of the page where it's kind of uh, indented. This is what Luke says, and this is how he uses the comparison. So, he's comparing Mar uh, Mary as the new ark to the old ark. Okay? Now, remember, in the book of Revelation, John writes that... He, on, on the Lord's day, he beholds in heaven, and he says, Behold, a woman. He says, Behold the ark. Now, the ark had been missing for 600 years. Jews would have been very excited all of a sudden he's found the ark. <laughs> and he says, Behold, a woman clothed in the sun, a crown of 12, 12 stars on her head, standing on the moon. The ark is Mary. All right? And John writes about it in the book of Revelations in Scripture. But Luke writes this in 2 Samuel 6. He says, David arose and went to, the, uh, to bring the ark to the, uh, the covenant to the hill country of Judah. In Luke 139, Luke writes, Mary arose and went to greet Elizabeth in the hill country of Judah. When the Old Testament ark arrived, as when Mary arrived, they were both greeted with shouts of joy. Second Samuel, David says, How can the ark of the Lord come to me? Luke 143, Elizabeth says, why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Pretty obvious. He's using, he's patterning it after, uh, after the original ark. Second Samuel, the ark of the covenant remained in the house in the hill country for three months. Luke 143, Mary remained in Elizabeth's house for three months. Second Samuel 6, David leaps for joy before the ark. First, uh, Luke 1, 41. The baby in Elizabeth's womb leaps for joy before Mary, the Ark of the New Covenant. The Ark was returned to its home and ended up in Jerusalem. Guess who else returned home and ends <laughs> up in Jerusalem? Mary. It's obvious he's making the point. Mary is the new Ark. Um, okay. Any questions about typology? Okay. The Immaculate Conception, page 37. Now, Catholics get this wrong too. A lot of Catholics will say, oh, Immaculate Conception, that's when Jesus was conceived. No, 
We're talking about Mary being conceived immaculate, without sin. All right. So, the, as it says in the Catechism, Mary's was preserved from the first instant of her conception by a singular grace given by God, all right, because of the merits of Jesus Christ, free from original sin. All right, so from the moment Mary was conceived, God, by a singular grace, grants that she would be sinless, all right, in preparation for Jesus, who is God. Now, think about this. If in Scripture, in the book of Revelation, it says nothing impure can enter heaven. Why? Because if we enter into heaven with sin on us, we would be burned up. <clears throat> God is literally hotter than hell, as, as uh, Scott Hahn says it. God is described as an all-consuming fire of love. All right. <coughs> so, if we enter heaven with sin, we would be burned up. Well, if Jesus, who is God, enters Mary's womb and she has sin, she, couldn't, she wouldn't be able to withstand it. So she has to be sinless in order to contain God within her womb. Make sense? And wouldn't you think that he would want a perfect vessel, vessel Absolutely. for his child? Absolutely. All right. Okay, that sounds logical to me being a Catholic. Yes. Okay, but how do you explain that to a Protestant who is very um, ob objective to anything. Yes. Again, go back and use Scripture and use the teachings of the early fathers. Alright? In everything, use logic and patience. Alright, so... <laughs> All right. And lots, lots, lots of patience. Because patience. Right. even after you show them, sometimes they're not going to believe what's in front of them. Excuse me. Alright, turn this thing off. All right, Luke 1.28. When the angel greets Mary to tell her about her being, uh, her conceiving Jesus, so he's, what does he say? He says, Hail, full of grace. Now, there are other translations that say highly favored daughter. That's a terrible translation. The best translation for care, I can't even pronounce it, kakaratomani, which is the Greek, which it was, it was written in, what the angel says is, hail, full of grace. What does it mean to be full? It means there's no room for anything else. She is full of God's grace. That is, even, even Protestant scripture scholars admit that's what it means. She is full of God's grace. So, and it's a title. It's not, he's not, he's, he's, he's addressing her by her title, full of grace. He didn't say, Hail, we say, Hail Mary, full of grace. What he said was, Hail, full of grace. It's a, it's a title. All right? And so, part of that title, full of grace, this kakaratomani, this word in Greek, is a, pat, is a perfect past participle. That's the, 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 like we would say, a verb or an adverb. Or, it's a perfect past participle. What that means is, it is a perfect, meaning she is, she is perfect, but it also means as, far as a form of speech is that when he addresses her as full of grace, that means that not from that moment on, but it's past participle. She was always full of God's grace. It, go, it extends into the, the past, all right? So he is saying, basically, is he, he addresses her hell, Someone who has always been full of God's grace, basically is how you would say that, because of the form of speech it is. All right. Also, it also makes it clear that it's nothing to do with her; that it is all God's doing. Okay. Again, this has nothing to do with. She's not a goddess. She's a, a human being just like we are. She's a creature God created. It was by His grace that this happened. It has nothing to do with what she did or didn't do. Okay. But wouldn't the way that He addressed her, you know, as hell, 
Isn't that the same uh, way? Isn't that the same way that they would greet a king or yeah, queen? Yeah, it's like hail hairs, Caesar. Though. Yeah, I think that's splitting hairs. That's it's like. I mean, uh, they're putting him like yeah, up on well, the yes, and pedestal he is by the regard. title full of grace. But I wouldn't worry about hell so much. The other thing to notice is that when he calls her full of grace, this is before she said yes to being the mother of Jesus. So it's not because of what she did. He gives her that title, or he addresses her with that title before she says yes. So it's not it's it's from what she is, not from what she agrees to do. Okay? All right. The early fathers. Origin in 244 says Mary, immaculate of immaculate. Tertullian in 387, Mary, free from every stain of sin. Augustine, again, the one they revere so much. The Holy Virgin Mary, we know what abundance of grace for overcoming sin and every particular was conferred upon her. And so, she is the... The Immaculate Conception. Now, go down to the bottom of the page. How is that possible? In Romans 3.10, it says there is none righteous, not one. Romans 3.23 says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So, the objection is, it says all. So that means Mary too. Well, there's something called hyperbole. You're making a point. All right. Go down just a hair more and it says, not all verses are meant to be taken literally. Romans 5.19 clearly says, now listen, this is, a, this is a quote. By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Not all. Scripture says all in this case, many here. All is hyperbole. He's making a point. All right, but not all people are sinners. Jesus was fully human. Was he a sinner? No. Mm -hmm. The age of reason is seven. You can't sin. Part of the definition of sin is you have to know it's sinful, or it's not a sin. All right. Little children below the age of seven—that's the age of reason—can't sin because they can't know it's sinful. All right. So even if you tell the little one, "No, don't touch that," he does it. It's not a sin. It's just him being rebellious. All right? But it's not sinful. He doesn't know it's a sin. All right? People who have disabilities can't reason that it's sinful. They can't sin. All right? So, not all people have sinned. He's using hyperbole. Okay. Another one, Matthew 3, 5 through 6. John the Baptist went out to Jerusalem, and all Judea were baptized by him in the river Jordan. Do you think every single person in Jordan was baptized? I mean, in the in Judea was baptized? No. We know at least um, <coughs> Herod and Herodias and her daughter couldn't have been baptized. They're the ones who chopped his head off or had his head chopped off. So they weren't baptized. So not all people were baptized. All right. It's using hyperbole. Okay. Um, Okay, next objection. Mary says, My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Now this is when she has, she, the angel appears to her. My God, uh, she says, My God, in God, oh, we're well, fine. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. So there she's saying she needs a Savior. Yes. Well, if she needs a Savior, that means she sinned. No. Everyone needs a Savior. Even Mary, all right? But Mary was saved before she sinned. We were saved after we sinned. All right, so think of it this way. If there is a deadly virus going around, you can be, uh, you can give medicine which cures you, you're saved, or they can inoculate you to prevent you from getting the deadly disease. You are saved. Someone gave this example. You have a blind man, he's about to fall into this big ditch. Well, if he falls in, you can pull him out of the ditch and save him. Or you can grab him at the last moment and prevent him from falling in the ditch, and you saved him. That's what Mary did. He saved her from sinning. All right? So, yes, she still needs a Savior. Okay. Um, 
The last one is the objection that Protestants will give, saying that Mary couldn't have been sinless because at her conception because she couldn't have called on the name of Jesus and confessed her faith and asked Jesus as a Lord and Savior. That is a an invention just in the last several decades. That is not something scriptural. And you won't find those terms that Jesus is a personal Lord and Savior or ask Jesus in your heart. Those aren't biblical terms. That is unbiblical. Is it a good thing? Yes. We do it at every Mass right before communion. Lord, I'm not worthy to receive you, but only say, Lord, well, my soul shall be healed. So we've admitted we're a sinner. We go forward to ask Jesus not just into our heart, but into our body. So is the sinner's prayer a good thing? Is calling on Jesus a good thing? Yes. But it's not scriptural, and it has nothing to do with Mary being sinless. Okay. But she could get grace before Jesus anyway. I mean, in Old Testament, people... Well, grace, she did receive right. grace yeah. before Jesus. So it doesn't have anything to do with Right. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Uh, where are we here? Okay. Mary, ever virgin. This is a, this is a big, big, big deal. <coughs> Pull out your Bible. And turn to Matthew 13. And we're going to go um, 55 and 6. 55 and 56. And hold on to that place. Matthew 13, verses 55 and 56. Okay. And just want you to hold your place there because we're going to come right up to it. Okay. Now, the objection is, even though the early fathers taught that Mary was always a virgin, not just, not just up to the time and when she had Jesus, but the early fathers taught that Mary remained a virgin her whole life. Okay. Now, what's odd is, almost all denominations spring, uh, Protestant denominations spring from three people, Luther, Calvin, and Zwingli. Okay, and that's where most all the Protestant denominations come from. And then, if you want to branch off of one of those, you would say Wesley, who was Methodist. All right, and that's much later. But all four of those guys professed and taught that Mary remained a virgin her whole life. And yet, the Protestants today don't believe it. They believe Jesus was born of a virgin, Mary but they don't believe that Mary remained a virgin. And here is why. And this is where I want you to read with me. 55 and 6. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? Are not his brethren James and Joseph, or sometimes it's Joseph, and Simon and Judas? So here it names four brethren or brothers of Jesus. So, the obvious question is, well, if that's the case, then obviously Jesus had brothers, so Mary must have had other children. Perfectly logical 21st century American, all right, reasoning. But you're not reasoning the way 1st century Jews reason. All right. Notice it says, in this, in this um, translation, it says brethren, all right. In the... In the Jewish, or I would say Aramaic and Hebrew language, there was no word for cousin. So, all people who were cousins, uncles, any relative, actually, there are cases in Scripture that anyone in your tribe, Jesus from the tribe of Judah, any clansman, tri tribesman, in the tribe of Judah would have been called his brothers and sisters. All right? And so, did Jesus have brethren? Yes. Did he have brothers as in sons of Mary? No. And this is how you, you need to prove it. All right. First of all, go to Scripture. And if you look at Matthew 27, 56, and, and Mark 15, we're there. All right. It says, go to, go to Matthew 27, 56. Okay. 
Okay, this is <coughs> this is the this is the uh, crucifixion. All right, I'm going to start at 55. There were also many women there looking on from afar, who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him. Among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. Who did we just read? James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, right? So there's two of them. And the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Who are the sons of Zebedee? James and John, the sons of thunder. Okay? So here we have the two Jameses. All right? So one of them, but, but we've already read James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. Well, here we have the mother of James and Joseph. So, why isn't this Mary? Well, number one, whether it's Matthew or Luke or John, they all call Mary in every instance, and I, I know where they are. In every instance, they say the mother of Jesus. They never say the mother of James and Joseph. They would never say that. They would say the mother of Jesus. Every single time. All right, so they're not going to switch it here. The other thing you need to look back, look back probably a page to, well, let me find it. I'll, I'll show you. Okay, so Matthew 27, 61. This is at the tomb. And it says, when they go to the tomb, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there. Mm -hmm. If you go to 28, uh, 1, same thing. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the sepulcher, the tomb. All right. The other Mary. Now, jump over to John. Let me find it. John 19.25. But wasn't Mary a very popular name back then? Absolutely. And we're fixing to find out how popular it is. Well, John, what? 19, verse 25. Again, we're at the foot of the cross. Or at, on the road to the cross. <laughs> Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother. Remember I told you, they always say Jesus' mother. And his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas. Now, Clopas is the, the Greek. In, in Hebrew, it's Alphaeus. And so you will see other places where it says the wife of Alphaeus. It's the same guy. Clopas and Alphaeus are the same person. So, his mother, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. We just read about this other Mary twice, and of Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. Guess who the, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph is? This Mary. Mary, the wife of Clopas, not Mary, the wife of Joseph. Mm. All right. So if you read all that together, you get the you get the picture. The Mary, who is the mother of James and Joseph, is this lady. Now, what's odd? It says her sister Mary. Now, this isn't. This is my brother Daryl and my other brother Daryl. <laughs> all right. This is this is because I just told you, Klansmen Clans women were called brothers and sisters. Her sister is probably not her blood sister, it's probably her cousin. Alright, and it says in another passage that they lived with her. So, probably her cousin, but it kinswoman. Alright, we would say kinswoman. Alright. Alright. So the other thing to to and I'll find it real quick. Let me find it real quick. I want you to go to 2 Corinthians 5. No, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. Wrong one. Uh, hold on. it a minute ago and I'm going to lose my place here but I mentioned it a minute ago okay uh, uh, about the middle of the page the objection on page 40 so 
It gives the names of the brothers of Jesus. Okay. Go down just a couple of lines. Page 40. Okay, about the middle of the page. Go down just a couple of lines in the answer. Alright? Galatians 1.18. Paul says that he went up to visit Cephas, or uh, Peter. Alright? And he said, when he saw Peter, he said, I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Well, we just, the, none, the, none of the other apostles except James. So James is an apostle. We just saw where James is either the, the son of Clopas or the son of Zebedee. Right? Not his brother. You get what I'm saying? Okay. All right. I just wanted to make that last point. All right. Where are we? Um, okay. Common objection. And in fact, somebody brought it up this morning. What about Matthew 125? Go to Matthew 125. Almost the very last slide in Matthew. Uh, in, in Matthew 1. One twenty-four and 5. Okay. Matthew 1. Verse 24 and 5. Alright. And it's talking about Joseph taking Mary as his wife. He said, it says, he took his wife. But he knew her not until she had born a, a son. Most translations will say her firstborn son. Okay, so we have two problems here. It says that Joseph knew her not until she bore a son, Jesus. All right. So in our 21st century American mindset, that means that they had to have had sexual relations after that. Because it says they didn't have sexual relations before that. Alright? I'll get to the, uh, the firstborn son in a moment. Alright. But in first century Jewish culture, until did not mean anything, it had nothing to do with what comes after it. It only has to do with what came before. Okay? So, what a better translation is what you have in the New American Bible. And so in the New American Bible, if yours is the same, no, I have the RSV, I'm sorry. But it should read this. He had no relations with her at any time before she had a son. So it's, it has to do with what comes before. It has nothing to do with com what comes after. We know it doesn't mean they had sexual <coughs> relations after because until doesn't mean that. Okay? And this is how we know. S Samuel... Uh, 6.23, it says, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no children until the day of her death. Does that mean she had children after she died? <laughs> the day of her death. <laughs> it says until the day of her death. All right. How about, how about, uh, it says that Jesus would be with us always until the end of the world. Does that mean Jesus is not going to be with us after the end of the world? No. <laughs> Until does not mean what comes after. It only means that what happened up to that time. Okay. Now, what's more problematic is it says, until she bore her firstborn son. So that means there must be a second and third. No. Again, Jewish first century mindset. Firstborn had nothing to do with if there was a second or third. You could be a, an only child and be the firstborn child. Because the firstborn child is a term that designates the male child that opens the womb. That's what it has to deal with. It has nothing to do if there were other children. So Jesus is one of one. Okay? And I give you, I give you places to find that. Okay. Questions about this so far? Okay. We're going to jump over since we're also about the saints. Very quickly. Communion of saints. 
we read this in the uh, in the uh, Apostles' Creed. Mm -hmm. Protestants too. <laughs> yeah, read the Apostles' Creed. Some of them read the Nicene Creed. And in the in the Apostles' Creed, it talks about the communion of saints. Well, the, I don't know what they think it means, but the communion of saints are those who are in heaven, those who are preparing to go into heaven, being purified. That's what we call that purgatory. And those here on earth. Okay? Because when you are baptized, you become God's child. Alright? And therefore, as Jesus says repeatedly, God is God of the living, not of the dead. You don't, just because you die here on earth, doesn't mean you cease being God's child. Whether you're being purified in heaven or you're in heaven, you're still God's child. And therefore, you are part of God's family. It is all one family. Jesus is the head of of one body, all right? the body of Christ. Okay, so look at the, the, the passages. Romans 12, 5, we are one body in Christ and parts of one another. John 15, a great example. Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Therefore, we are part not only of Jesus, but of one another. Great example. John 11, 26, everyone who believes in me will never die. Go over to page 47. 1 Corinthians 12, Paul says, if one suffers, all suffer. If one is honored, all rejoice. How is that possible? Paul goes on to say, if we are afflicted, he was talking about him and the, the guys with him, then it is for your sake. How does him suffering have anything to do with us? It only happens if we are part of one another in God's family. So that it's, they, they talk about, uh, it's like a bank account. If you deposit something in it, it's all our bank account. We benefit from it. If you take something out, we all suffer. All right? And so Paul says, I'm suffering for your sake. It's because of the body of Christ. Okay? Jesus goes on, or Paul goes on to say that death cannot separate us from Christ or from one another. And Jesus tells the Pharisees, it's not God of the dead, he's God of the living. All right, so, the communion of saint is based, saints is based on four elements. All Christians are members of Christ's body and of one another. Jesus has only one body. Death cannot separate us from Christ or one another. And Christians are bound by mutual love. Okay, so therefore, the body of Christ is made up of a community of believers who can pray for each other, and death does not break that bond that is established. Okay, so that when we say that we can pray for each other, that means those who are in heaven can pray, those about to enter heaven can pray, and we can pray. And we can ask for their prayers, and we can pray for them. Okay, it's all one body. And since they, in fact, the ones in heaven are more alive and more holy, then their prayers are even better than ours because, as Scripture says, the, the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. In other words, if you're righteous, if you're holy, your prayers are more powerful. So their prayers, so we can ask for the saints' prayers. All right? Now, the problem is Protestants use the word pray to mean worship. They don't pray to the saints. They only pray to God. Therefore, they use it to mean worship. Well, we use it that way too when we pray to God. But we also use it in the Old English form. I, in fact, that's in the King James. Bathsheba goes to her son and she says, I pray thee, my Lord. She's asking him. So we can use it as a form of petition. Okay? That's the way we use it when we pray to the saints. We are asking them to pray for us. They can't do anything without God's help. But they can pray. Okay? All right. Now, you have several different verses there that show that praying is good and the angels pray and the saints pray. Uh, and I want to show you a quick clip. This is Dr. David Anders, former Protestant minister, Presbyterian, <coughs> if I remember right. And this is why do we honor and pray to Mary and the saints? Uh, let's see.
And here's the reason that we have it. Okay. Let's talk about both of sharing the church together with members of the body of Christ. Well, it just continues after that. The church never stops praying for one another, taking each other's words before the church is over. So once I understood in that light, I said, oh, okay, well, this business about asking the saints for their prayers makes perfect sense within the whole scope of the revelation. What then is the Blessed Virgin Mary? Well, first of all, recognize her as one of the saints. Okay, okay. I mean, she's more than that, but she is not less than one of the saints. If you believe that St. Anthony or St. Francis can pray for you, well, then how much more can the Blessed Virgin pray for you? But there's an extra special thing about Mary. And that is that um, of all the saints, she's the only one that gave birth to God. It was in her womb that the second person of the Trinity became incarnate. It was from her that he assumed a human nature. That's kind of important. It's a little bit kind of a trick, you know? I mean, like, what's the point of your life? You had to grow up, become an accountant or a doctor or a veterinarian? No, I'm going to give birth to God. The only person in the history of time, from the beginning to the end of the universe, who will have the privilege of being the mother of God. Eh, no big deal. You know, better, better go become a surgeon. I'm sorry, no, there is no, there is no more big deal That's right. than being the mother of God. Through her, the redemption of the entire universe takes place. You know, and, and should we dignify her because of that? You know, St. Paul tells us in book Romans 13, he says, Render to everyone what is their due, honor to whom honor. We erect a monument in D.C. to George Washington, to Abe Lincoln, you know, to uh, Jefferson Memorial, sure. Is that worthy? Is that just? Is it okay to do that? You know, if you go to Hollywood, you can, what's the, what's the street with all the stars? Walk of Fame. Yeah, you sure. go on the Walk of Fame, and you know, John Wayne's got a star on the sidewalk. Is that okay to do? Sure it is. Of course it is. It's right and just to honor eminent people for things that they've done, civil acts of courage or, or, or heroism or whatever. But no, we can't do that for the person who gave birth to God. <laughs> That's absurd. Of course we're going to honor her in a manner that's commensurate with, that's proportionate to her dignity. And what human contribution to the work of redemption could be greater than saying yes to the Incarnation? Remember, she did this of her own free will. Be it done to me according to thy word. That is a holy and righteous act. And she signed up for suffering. It wasn't an easy thing to be the mother of God. It was a, it was a bit of a trip to be the mother of God. Oh, yeah. And she signed up for it. Should we not honor and dignify her for that? Now, what, 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 if we can put a monument up in D.C. to former president, what level of dignity would be appropriate to the woman who said yes to the incarnation and brought about the salvation of the universe? What level of dignity? Well, not divine honors, not worship, not adoration. That's due to God alone. We only offer sacrifice to God, not to the saints. But, you know, ever been to a football game? SEC football, go see Alabama and Auburn? You ever see the fans jump up and down on stage and hoot and holler and yell and wave the flag and, and, and scream for their team, roll tide, war eagle? Oh, baby. All right? I, if that's okay, but you can't do that for Mary. No, 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 can't do that for Mary. There's an enormous industry in Alabama surrounding, you know, Crimson Tide football. Yes. And I tell people we have the best football team in the nation for one reason. We get what we pay for. <laughs> that's right. We pour enough money into it, you'll get what we that's okay. <laughs> of course it's okay. She's the mother of God. And uh, as long as you understand, you differentiate in your mind, that that to you can't say yea, Mary, loud enough. But we never offer her sacrifice. We never present to Mary the worship that is due to God alone. Or to any of the saints. All right? Hmm. You understand the Protestants, with the very best of intentions, they 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 want they they look at Catholics and they see a statue and they see a, a, a Catholic kneel down before it. They think worship, obvious. It's obvious. No, no more idea about worshiping the statue than anyone you know. But you get you understand at least here where they would get that idea. We just have to make sure they understand that's not what we're doing. No thought of doing that. Okay? Now, the other thing is, in Scripture, in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy, it says that you shouldn't communicate with the dead. Well, that's because necromancy, or I'm in the, the middle of uh, 48. Necromancy,
necromancy, or necromancy, however you pronounce that, is you were communicating with the dead like a seance to get them to foretell your future, tell you what's going to happen. All right? This is not that. We're simply communicating with the saints to tell them to pray for us, to ask them to pray for us. All right? Now, my favorite verse in, in the scriptures, and for a lot of reasons, is Hebrews, this very top of the page, Hebrews 12, 1. Now, remember that the, the verses and chapter numbers weren't put in until the 13th and 16th century. So it was all written together. All right? So there weren't chapter and verse numbers. <laughs> many, many, many years later, more recent. So, the entire 11th chapter is about the great heroes of the faith, what they did and how they died and suffered for the faith. All right? And then it goes into chapter 12 and it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run the race of life. So it's, it's describing almost a stadium scene and all the great heroes of the faith cheering us on in our race of life, urging us on to, toward heaven. All right? Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Heaven's not just up there. They're all around us. It means we should probably act a little better. <laughs> all right? All right. So, when we communicate with the saints, one of the objections is they can't possibly in heaven, only God is omniscient, omnipotent, omniscient, and so forth, that only God could know. The saints can't know what's going on. Well, let me go to the bottom of the page. Jesus says, Mark 12, 24 through 27, Jesus said to them, For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. God said to him, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. So they're not dead. They're not unresponsive to our petitions. Um, go to the next page. As for them not being able to hear that, you know, the, because of the laws of physics, they're in heaven, they're dead, they can't hear us. Number one, they're not dead, they're alive. All right? But they're not bound because God gives them some of His grace in order to hear our prayers. When John himself says that he was lifted by an angel into heaven, this is the book of Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, he says, let me find it, um, find it, find it, find it. He says he was able to hear, here it is, apparently the saints in heaven do hear, uh, where is this? Uh, Oh, I've lost it. I'm sorry. But he basically says he was able to hear every creature and everything they said or every sound they made. God apparently shared that with John. And John was still alive. All right? Beyond that, they can hear what we say. It says that they're, they're angels. All of this, with God sends angels to oversee us, our guardian angels. He said those angels are always with his children and always behold the face of God. They're with God and with us. All right? So they can hear. They do know what's going on with us. All right. Uh, let's see. Have you ever heard oh, of, if you, um, somewhere I read that if you, if you pray your guardian angel, you should always say it out loud because angels don't know what we're thinking. Oh, I don't know, and so I wonder. Yeah, right. I, I wondered if do you have if can you pray silently and no? I mean, because when you I said they have Mary, so. yeah, I would think so. It would. It would yeah, be. I don't know that that's a teaching of the church. Okay. I, I wouldn't think so. All right, here's what I here's where it was when John, uh, the angel takes him to heaven. He says, "I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea saying to him who sits upon the throne." And the Lamb be blessed in honor and glory and might forever and ever. That's John, who was still alive. And God gives him that ability to hear a creature. Can you imagine the angels and the saints? All right. <coughs> Beyond that, and this is what I want you to remember. Turn to the book of Revelation. Revelation 5, 8. 
very end of the Bible. Book of Revelation. 5.8. This is John in heaven. He says, And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, Jesus, each holding a harp, and with golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, and they sang a new song. Get what this says. The elders, the saints in heaven, are holding these golden bowls full of the prayers of the saints, us on earth. Did they go right to God? No. They went to the saints and they were offering them to God. All right. So apparently the saints did, can receive our prayers and it's okay with God. Turn to 8.3. Probably another page. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a gold censer. And he was given much incense to mingle with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense rose with the prayers of the saints from the hand of the angel before God. Get this, the angel is offering our prayers to God. So here we have two sections in inerrant, infallible Scripture saying that the saints and the angels get our prayers and offer them to God. Now, did God hear them directly? Oh, you can bet. But in heaven, it's okay for them to receive our prayers and offer them to God. It's okay. It's in Scripture. Okay? So, if somebody argues the saints and the angels can't hear us and they can't, we can't pray to them. It's okay with God. It should be okay with you. <laughs> okay. Um... Probably the, the <coughs> most common objection we get is this one from this, the middle of page 49. First Timothy 2.5 says, There is one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all. So, there's only one mediator, therefore... You should only pray to Jesus because Jesus is the only mediator. We can't be mediators. The saints can't be mediators. It says in the infallible scripture that Jesus is the only mediator. Except, it doesn't say Jesus is the only mediator of our prayers. It says Jesus is the only mediator. I want you to see, look at the last part of the line. Who gave himself as a ransom for all. What is it talking about? Jesus was the sacrifice who was ransomed for our sins. All right? There are two other verses, and I'll just give them to you. Don't look them up. But in Hebrews, I'll find them. Uh, where is it? 9.15. You're, yeah, I'm losing. I should have underlined it. There are two of them, 9.15 and 12.24. Yeah. In both of those lines, it talks about Jesus being the mediator because of his death. All right, It's talking about Jesus being the mediator of our salvation, not the mediator of our prayers. It's very specific. All three verses talk about Jesus' death. It's talking about Jesus being sacrificed for our sins. It's not saying that Jesus is the only mediator of our prayers. Otherwise, he wouldn't have told the disciples. He breathes on them in the upper room, says, receive this. Well, right before that, he says, uh, he says, as the Father sends me, so I send you. Receive the Holy Spirit who sends you forgive or forgiven. He wouldn't have given them the power to forgive sins if he was the only mediator. He wouldn't have said at the end, go out and teach all nations, making them teachers that position if he was the only teacher. Therefore, we need priests. If that's the case, then no one ever has to go to church again because Jesus is our only mediator. You don't need preachers. You don't need teachers. You don't... See what I'm saying? How ridiculous that is? I get it. I get what they're saying. Jesus is the only mediator. Yes, of our salvation, not of our prayers. Okay? 
Paul, 2 Corinthians 5. We have become Christ's co-laborers as if God were making His appeal through us. Paul is saying that they are mediators. Okay? Okay. Which, which one was that of Paul? 2 Corinthians 5. Okay. Now, can we honor Mary and the saints? Let me show you a quick clip. This is <coughs> Schmidt. I'm going to show you two back to back here because we're kind of running short. Uh, do Catholics worship saints? Fun thing about Father is he talks very fast. <laughs> Hi, my name is Father Mike Schmitz, and this is Ascension Presents. So I was recently talking with a man, he's a missionary with FOCUS, the Fellowship of Catholic University Students, this awesome guy. He wasn't always a missionary, and actually he wasn't even always Catholic. He wasn't even always Christian. He became a Christian when he was 19 years old. He encountered Christ in this powerful way. But then in the course of the next few years, he kind of became a little bit, I guess what you'd say, anti-Catholic. He, he had a number of things against the Catholic Church, and one of the things he had against the Church was he said that, um, he believed that, we as Catholics worshipped the saints. We said, no worship belongs to God alone. But I see all their paintings, I see all the kneelers in front of the statues, I see the, <laughs> the candles in front of the in front of the icons or in front of the paintings. Like they, it's really clear, it's really obvious. For us, we're like, no, not at all. There, there's a probably, if you're raised Catholic, there is nothing in you that when you see a statue thinks, oh, I want to bow down before that statue. You look at the statue and think, oh, hey, there's a statue of oh that's St. Francis of Assisi, or there's a painting of Mother Teresa. And you just think it's a painting of a family member. You think it's a statue of one of your older brothers or one of your older sisters. It has no more significance, no more weight, no more desire to, to impulse to worship that thing than when you see a picture of your family. They're simply reminders to us. Someone could say that. No. Someone could say, what about you know, God saying, don't, uh, don't uh, create a graven, make any graven image to worship. We say, you're right, we're not worshiping. What about the graven image? Now, God didn't completely prohibit making images. One, in the Old Testament, he, he uh, conscripts the Israelites to fashion angels over the top of the Ark of the Covenant. He tells Moses to make a bronze serpent on a staff, and those who look at the bronze serpent on that staff will become healed. In the New Testament, Jesus is the, fully, the fullness of God revealed. And there was this big, big heresy called the uh, iconic, iconoclast heresy way back in the day, where the question was, should all images be destroyed? You know, um, icons be destroyed? Or the, are those icons, are those images, reminders to us of God's goodness? And the church definitively came to the conclusion, the Christian church came to the definitive conclusion that those images not being worshipped are simple reminders of God's goodness. That's why we talk about the saints so much. Because I've heard people also say, well, you guys, you talk about the saints more than you talk about Jesus. Now, A, if that's what we're doing, we need to stop that. We need to talk about Jesus far more than anything or anyone else. But does it take away from the honor belonging to God if we talk about the saints? We all love testimonies, don't we? I mean, I'm sure if you're a Christian who's not a Catholic, you've gone to a thing when someone stepped up and said, yeah, here's my life before I met Jesus, then I met Jesus, here's my life after I met Jesus. You wouldn't say, hey, sit down and stop talking about yourself, only talk about Jesus. They'd say, no, 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 I'm, I'm talking about what God did in my life. Look at what God has done in the life of an ordinary, average person. He took their ordinary life and he made it extraordinary. He actually even took a, a broken, destroyed life and made it remarkable and phenomenal. That doesn't take away from God's honor any more than if you went to uh, an art gallery and there was the artist standing next to their painting. And you went on and you said, oh my goodness, look at this painting. This painting is incredible. Look at it, the, the colors and the detail and the, the, the creativity you put behind it. The artist wouldn't stand next to the painting and say, hey, uh, um, hello, over here, why are you looking at my painting? Why are you talking about how great my painting is? I'm right here. When you're praising what the artist did, you're actually praising the artist. The same thing is true when we talk about the saints. We're not just talking about how good Joseph or Mary or Therese or whoever it was. We're talking about how amazing God is. That God took this ordinary, average person and made something extraordinary by His grace 
through them. Lastly, what about asking for the saints' prayers? Isn't that isn't that like kind of a um, prohibited in the Bible? Don't we? Isn't Jesus the one mediator between God and man? Well, we say, of course, Jesus is the one mediator between God and man. He is the one, the only one who gives us access to the Father. But as we all know, Jesus has enlisted a whole host of co-workers, hasn't he? Scripture even talks about this. this could we become co-workers with Christ? And in that, whenever you've taught someone about Jesus, you were a mediator of the teaching of Jesus. Whenever you've prayed with someone, you were a mediator of God's grace in a certain way. Whenever you even gave someone a Bible or shared a, a link like to a video like this, you became a mediator of part of God's truth, part of God's word, part of God's wisdom, part of God's life. And Jesus is the one mediator between God and man of salvation. But again, as I said, he's enlisted a whole host of brothers and sisters, co-workers, and he's commissioned us to be co-mediators. And I say that in a very specific term, with him. If you were to go to another Christian and say, hey, I'm going through a lot, would you pray for me? They wouldn't look at you and say, ah, I'm not going to pray for you. Go right to Jesus. You, you talk to Jesus. I'm not going to talk to Jesus for you. They would say, of course I will. The same is true when it comes to the saints, those who have died. We believe they are not dead. We believe they are alive with Christ. In fact, Revelation chapter 4, 5, 6, and 8 all talk about the fact that the saints in heaven right now are praying. They're praying to worship God, but they're also praying for us here on this earth. It's simply saying, those of you who have died in Christ and are alive with him, in him right now, please, you are my brothers and sisters. You are more alive than anyone. Please pray to our Lord on my behalf. The saints, every single one of them, with their lives, with their death, with their words, with their actions, with their everything, they point us more and more to Jesus. But to deny that we have brothers and sisters in heaven would not give God more honor. It would not give God more glory. It would simply deprive us of the family that he's given us. Last thing. Early on in the, in the Christian uh, church, in about the fourth century, St. Augustine even talked about this. He says, when it comes to the saints, we give them dulia, which means honor, veneration. When it comes to Mary, we give her hyperdulia, which is just even, even more honor and veneration. When it comes to God, we give him latria, which is worship. We, and, and worship belongs to him alone. This is all to praise God. And he wants to bless us through his saints. For all of us here to say, presents my name, Father Mike. God bless. Father who? Father who? Father Mike Schmidt. Oh, okay. Mike Schmidt. 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 Okay, this is Kathy. He didn't talk fast. Yeah, he needs to cut, cut, cut yeah. back on the caffeine. <laughs> you can tell it was edited, though. It must have been a yeah. long yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, they do. Well, with him, it's, he can go on for a while. Anyway, this is Patrick Madrid. He gives lots of talks, and he is really good. He's the one, if you, if you look up on YouTube on debates, Patrick Madrid, mm -hmm. and you'll see where he and the two other Catholic men are debating the three Protestant preachers on um, scripture and sacred tradition and also on salvation and it's really really good stuff all right so this is patrick madrid on worshiping statues the one true god one day carl keating my friend at catholic answers he and i were to speak at a parish in chicago and i love telling this story because it literally happened as i'm about to describe it to you we pulled up in front of the rectory at the parish and on the front lawn were these very large and beautiful life-size statues of Our Lady of Fatima, and then the three smaller statues of the children of Fatima, kneeling with their hands folded in prayer in front of the bigger statue. And I turned to my colleague, Carl, and I said, what a great religion. Not only can we worship statues, but our statues can worship statues. <laughs> this is a true story. This really happened. When you hear this story told, you know that it happened to me. And so Carl and I chuckled about it, and then I thought, well, that's kind of a funny way to open the evening. So I opened the talk that evening by telling the story. The Catholics chuckled, just like you did, but there were some non-Catholics in the audience that evening who didn't chuckle. And one of them happened to be a local Baptist minister who, at the Q&A period, he said, why were you laughing? Because we know that you do worship statues. And so then I had a perfect setup for the question and answer to explain from the Bible that it's not idolatry. Uh, to go back to the Ark of the Covenant, you can see 
in Exodus 25, which is just five chapters later, that that's where God commands Moses to carve graven images. And those are the graven images of the angels that would sit on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And they were certainly religious. They were certainly very holy. And God commanded this. So I began to see, well, it's not images. It is idolatry. Now, there's just like a little mini hors d'oeuvre for you to think about when it comes to apologetics. There's an example of how apologetics can be done in a simple way, you know, a little bit of scripture, and then you make some common sense explanations. We, we have images of Our Lady and, and Jesus and other great figures of our faith in the same way that you might have pictures of your family and friends on the wall of your living room. You see them and you remember them and you love them even though you couldn't care anything one way or the other about the paper. If you saw me kiss a picture of my wife and children, you wouldn't be shocked and think, what's wrong with that guy? He loves Kodak paper. You know what? <laughs> you would know that it's the people represented. So there's just like a little mini exercise in apologetic. <laughs> hmm. He tells some humorous stories. He's, real, he's, he's been through a lot. He's, he's done a lot of debates and stuff. Okay. So. He has a three hour a day radio show and I never get tired of it. Oh yeah. It. Yeah. He's, I love that story. I heard him tell that at a conference in Houston. And um, there's, there's so many instances where he goes to talk uh, and uh, give a talk and uh, something funny like that happens. Well, when you're dealing with so many different and varieties of, of Protestants, there are a lot of different and varieties of objections. And so, um, uh, there was one, take, we'll tell you real quickly and then we'll finish. Uh, there was one where the, the preacher asked of this little non-denominational church, asked him if he would come and talk to his, his congregation about what Catholics believe. And he says, I'll agree to do that, but I don't want this to be a debate between me, us or, or me to debate your, I don't want to take a lot of questions. I just want to, if, I, if you want me to just tell what Catholics believe, I'll be glad to do that. Well, the preacher sets him up, and so he's not only taking questions from them, the preacher is hounding him at every turn and uh, in front of the congregation. And so uh, he, uh, he says... Uh, he says, well, just name one thing. It's just, I think you heard that in the debate. Name one thing that we absolutely need for our salvation in your sacred tradition. And he said, I took my Bible and went, there you go. The New Testament, their <laughs> sacred tradition. And he said, the guy just it floored him. He didn't know what to say after that. You know, so he, he has those kind of things that happen. <laughs> anyway, any questions? Okay. okay. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's wrap it up. We'll wrap it up with prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we'll just say the Hail Mary. Hail, Hail Mary, full of grace, grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed, blessed art thou among women, and, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Very good. Thank you. Is there going to be a pop? Quiz or no. final exam? No. Or? Let's hope not. Good. <laughs> We're not going to have mock debates. No. <laughs>